It is the year 1980, and we're going to be going over a classic 80s horror movie. And as I mentioned, this one's going to be The Fog, another supernatural horror film, which was directed by one of the greatest horror directors of all time, John Carpenter. The film stars Adrian Barbo, Jamie Lee Curtis, Tom Atkins, Janet Lee, which is cool seeing Janet Lee and Jamie Lee Curtis in a movie, and Hal Holbrook. The story is about a strange fog that sweeps over a small town, which brings vengeful ghosts who were killed in a shipwreck a hundred years earlier. I know, I know it sounds lame, but trust me, if you've never seen The Fog, watch it. It is so good, because I literally only the first time I watched The Fog was for this episode. The reason why I hadn't seen The Fog before was because I listened to too many people, and I'm going to stop listening to people. Because any time I brought up The Fog, it'd be like, oh, The Fog? The Fog's so bad. Oh, that's a terrible movie. It's not even a good B movie. Oh, it's so bad. This and that. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, if, if it's that bad, I'm not going to waste my time. But I figured, you know, 1980, it's a John Carpenter or Jamie Lee Curtis movie. Like, come on. I have to watch this. And if it's bad, I can bash it and talk about how bad it is on the podcast. But I watched it, and I'm like, what is everyone's gripe with this? This is a great film. It is John Carpenter classic. I loved it. (laughs) I absolutely loved The Fog. But anyways, back to talking about the movie. Inspiration for The Fog came partly from a British film called The Trollenberg Terror, which was released in 1958, and it focused on monsters hiding in the clouds, which can definitely be loosely connected to what we see in the film. The Fog was part of a two-picture deal that Carpenter had with Avco Embassy, and the second film in that deal was Escape from New York, which was released in 1981. They shot The Fog on a budget of $1 million, which makes it essentially a low-budget horror film, though we all know that budget won't stop John Carpenter from putting out his vision. There's no way. He started filming for The Fog in April 1979 at Rally Studios in Hollywood, California, and there was also several on-location spots shot in California as well. Filming of The Fog ended in May 1979, and after reviewing a rough cut of the film, Carpenter wasn't happy at all. Because (laughs) Carpenter's never happy. No, I'm just kidding. He thought that The Fog was was terrible. So he added a prologue, the one where we saw Mr. Mackin telling ghost stories to children by a campfire. And he also added several other scenes and reshot a whole bunch of others. He actually probably adjusted about one-third of the film that we have now to try and make it more scary and gory. Because Carpenter and Hill really felt that was necessary due to the fact that they were competing with horror films that had high gore content, which is is not out of the realm, right? Like, this was the golden era of slasher films. It's no surprise that fans wanted more gore. Like, it really isn't. The Fog also has some serious connections to the Halloween 1978 film. Of course, you have, you know, Carpenter and Hill at the helm, but that's not all. The character played by Tom Atkins is named Nick Castle, which, of course, was the actor that played Michael Myers in the first Halloween movie. Tom Atkins also ends up playing in Halloween 3 Season of the Witch as the lead, which, of course, you know, you couldn't tell that future when The Fog came out, but hey, it's still a connection. Of course, you know, I don't need to make the obvious connection that Jamie Lee Curtis stars in this movie. If you don't know that connection, go watch Halloween. (laughs) And Tommy Lee Wallace is also backstage for this film, as he was in Halloween to help with production. Now, in addition to the film's $1 million budget, Avco Embassy also spent over $3 million on marketing for the film alone. This included placing fog machines in lobbies of select theaters and really creating that atmosphere that the audience was going to expect from the fog. So it had a staggered release in various cities, which began on February 1st, 1980, and then expanded later in the month. And it was definitely a box office success, despite if people like it or not. (laughs) It was a box office success. It brought in $21.3 million between the US and Canada. So you can't tell me that that wasn't a successful box office on a $1 million budget. They made $20 million in 1980. That's like $80, $100 million today. (laughs) Like, it made money. So let's waste no further time. Let's dive into The Fog and talk about what happens in this awesome horror movie that came out in 1980. The Fog kicks us off with a ghost story. On the eve of the 100th anniversary of the founding of a small coastal town in Antonio Bay, Northern California, Mr. Malkin is telling ghost stories by a campfire to children on the beach. One of these stories is about a local ship which had crashed against the rocks because they had mistaken a campfire for a lighthouse. All the crew had ended up drowning in the wreckage. Once midnight hits, paranormal activity begins around the town. The town priest, Father Malone, also discovers his grandfather's diary at the church when a piece of masonry falls from the wall. It reveals to him that in 1880, a terrible incident occurred. The six founders of Antonio Bay, one of them, including Malone's grandfather, had deliberately sank a ship named Elizabeth Dane, 
This was also that the owner of the ship, Blake, could not establish a colony nearby since the crew was afflicted with leprosy. The gold that was plundered from this crew was then used to help found the town, which you can assume, of course, where this story's going at this point. Now, while the plot may be predictable and borderline campy, <laughs> this film did an excellent job of setting a story right from the start and immediately building suspense. The Fog also gives off tons of Lovecraft vibes. I don't know about you guys, for people who have seen this, I, I got tons of Lovecraft vibes from this movie. Even though I know we're not dealing with an extravagant sea creature of sorts, we're not dealing with Cthulhu here, the setting of the movie feels very Lovecraftian, and the way Carpenter builds suspense with the unknown is, is super parallel. Anyways, meanwhile, we see three fishermen out at sea. They're listening to the local radio station when a strange glowing fog begins to overtake them in their ship. With the fog, it brings the lost ship Elizabeth Dane, which is carrying the vengeful spirits of Blake and his crew, who end up killing the fishermen. We then meet Nick Castle, <laughs> who's, I can't say that without laughing a little bit, because I just think that's so funny. Anyways, he's driving his truck home, and he ends up picking up a young hitchhiker named Elizabeth. Then we go to the next morning, and we see the local radio DJ Stevie being given a piece of driftwood by her son Andy. The driftwood is inscribed with the word Dane on it. <laughs> See where this is going? So Stevie asks Andy where he found it, and he says he found it on the beach. This intrigues Stevie, of course, so she takes it with her to her lighthouse where she broadcasts her radio show from. However, when she places the wood down next to her tape player, it begins to seep water. This causes the tape player to short circuit, and a mysterious voice comes from the tape player swearing revenge. The words, Six must die, then start to appear on the wood before it bursts into flames in front of Stevie. So Stevie heads to grab a fire extinguisher, you know, put the fire out on the wood. Then when Stevie ends up extinguishing the fire, the wood reads Dane once again, and the tape player begins working as normal. Spooky! So one of the fishermen who were attacked by the spirits earlier in the movie, they were pretty close to Nick. So Nick begins to investigate what happened, where his buddy is, with the help of Elizabeth. When they find their trawler, they also find the corpse of one of the fishermen there with their eyes gouged out. Pretty cool. <laughs> they weren't able, though, to find the others, so they bring the body into town, and once they're in the autopsy room, the corpse starts rising and approaches Elizabeth. Collapses on the floor in front of her, she starts screaming. Nick and the coroner show up, and they see the lifeless corpse, who had carved the number three onto the floor. Later that evening, the hundredth year celebration for the town begins and the local weatherman, Dan, calls Stevie to warn her of another fog bank rolling into town. Stevie, at this point, is already on edge, and she's totally spooked from the events that occurred at the radio station, so she's pretty skeptical on this call with Dan. While they're talking, the fog ends up gathering outside the weather station and knocks on Dan's door. Of course, he answers it, and ends up being murdered by the spirits as Stevie listens on in horror. Stevie then realizes that she has the best view of this fog being at the lighthouse, so she decides to stick it out and proceeds with her radio show. She gives updates on the fog's movement as it moves closer inland and disrupts phone and power lines all over town. So because of this, Stevie sets up her backup generator, keeps the information coming out, and begs listeners at the same time to save her son, because she sees the fog closing in on her house. Nick and Elizabeth, they hear this cry over the radio, they head down to save Andy before the fog can swallow him whole, thankfully. At that point, Stevie's advising everyone to head down to the town church to try to get away from the fog. So Nick, Elizabeth, Andy, Kath, her assistant, and Father Malone all take refuge in the back of the church as the fog starts to arrive outside. While they're inside this room, they find a gold cross, which is discovered to be made out of the remaining stolen gold from the plunder a hundred years ago. So the spirits arrive, they begin their attack on the church and everyone in it, when Malone takes that gold cross into the chapel. He knows that they've returned to take six lives, in lieu of the original conspirators who had murdered them a hundred years ago. So Malone offers himself up along with the remaining gold, as long as the others are spared. Back at the lighthouse, the spirits have arrived, and they're now attacking Stevie while trapping her on the roof. Back inside the church... Blake takes the gold cross, and it starts to glow. Nick pulls Malone away from the cross just mere seconds before it disappears in a flash of light, and the rest of the spirits go along with it. Stevie ends up making her way down from the roof once the spirits disappear and the fog vanishes, making it back inside safely. 
The film ends with Malone. He's alone in the chapel, asking why he was not taken and there were only five deaths. However, the fog reappears inside the chapel, along with the spirits, and they decapitate Malone as the film cuts to black. Honestly, I feel like the fog stands the test of time. I really do. Like, this was off the heels of Halloween. This came out in 1980. Halloween was 1978. And Carpenter knew he had to come with something that was heavy hitting, something that would expand his legacy. It would also cement him as an amazing horror director, definitely one of the best we've ever had. And it also further pushed the career of Jamie Lee Curtis, right? Everybody knows Jamie Lee Curtis. Even if you're not a horror fan, you know Jamie Lee Curtis, whether it be True Lies or if you do know her from horror like Halloween in the Fog, like... These movies helped push her career to the stardom she has now and also cemented her as one of our favorite scream queens. Like, hands down, Jamie Lee Curtis is one of the greatest final girls and scream queens, period, end of sentence. And this movie really gave us those sides of Jamie Lee Curtis, and it really made the movie a lot more engaging for me. And not only that, but I felt the suspense right away. Like, as soon as I hit play, it was rolling in, the fog's coming, we're going over this ghost story. I was immediately pulled into the story. I'm like, wow, shit's going down, like, right now. <laughs> like, there's, they're not building this up slowly so that, you know, it's some big buildup and a disappointing drop. No, they're doing something that is actually going to give you a good time. And it's so suspenseful, and it really creates that tension early on. To the point where you kind of wonder what's going on, and then when you figure it out, you're like, oh, okay, well, there's a reason behind all of this. It's not just, oh, there's a fog, and it's taking over the town, and oh, it's ghosts. Like, there's an actual story behind it. There is lore as to why these ghosts or these spirits, you know, whatever you want to call them, are coming back and attacking people of the town. Amazing film. And I'm so glad that this was the first horror movie that we got to pick for our 80s decade in review. Fog came out in 1980, so that means next week we're going to have a movie from 1981. And if you want to know what movie it'll be, make sure you're following me on Instagram, Cabin of Horrors Podcast, because I always announce the next week's episode, usually on like a Thursday or a Friday around that time. You'll always find out what'll be on next week's episode, so make sure you're following me. And thanks again for tuning in to episode one of season two on the Cabin of Horrors podcast. I really, really appreciate it. I know I say that a lot, but I honestly appreciate each and every one of you who take the time to listen to the podcast. Truly, I hope you get something out of it. I hope you learn something about your favorite horror movie or you find a new horror movie you didn't know existed that you might fall in love with. These are the reasons why I do the podcast, and I really hope you take that away when you listen to one of my episodes. And thank you guys again. You guys, you guys are just awesome. But anyways, I'll stop the, the pandering and the sap stuff. We'll be back again next week with episode two, season two. I won't even give a hint as to what we're going over next week. So make sure you're following Cabin of Horrors podcast on Instagram, because then you'll get all the up-to-date information on what's going on with the podcast. I am your host, the Incredible Josh, and until next time, see you in the shadows. <laughs>